record setting, inspirational, unprecedented. A lot of adjectives have been thrown around when talking about Polaris Dawn, the first private space mission culminating in an EVA. Let's talk about why. Hello everybody and welcome. Private space is starting to make some big waves. Today we'll talk about Polaris Dawn, a fully privately funded space mission that launched on September 10th and concluded on September 15th. It sent Commander and the person funding it all, Jared Isaacman, pilot Scott Petit and mission specialist Sarah Gillis and Anna Menon, both SpaceX employees, into a very high orbit where they performed spacewalks in brand new EVA suits. With all crew members safely back on Earth, it's time to look at five things we can learn from Polaris Dawn. Fitting, since the mission lasted five days, don't you think? But before I talk about all the facts and figures of the mission, I would like to talk to you about two different numbers. The number 10 and the number 100,000. <laughs> you see, at the end of this year, it's going to be 10 years since I first started this channel. And I really would like to crack the 100,000 subscriber mark until then. So if you could hit that subscribe button, I would really appreciate it. Okay. Now to the numbers you really care about, because we're going to start with new records. Polaris Dawn set quite a couple of records during its five-day mission. First, the Crew Dragon capsule that carried the four astronauts went into an orbit with an altitude of 1400 kilometers at its highest point. That was the farthest anyone has been away from Earth since the final Apollo mission, Apollo 17, back in 1972. Later, the ship settled at an altitude of 730 kilometers. The reason for going up that high was not just to simply break a record, but to also conduct science experiments, for instance concerning radiation exposure. Going up that high automatically set another record. It was the furthest a female astronaut ever went away from Earth. Sarah Gillis and Anna Menon both share this record now. Another record was set not just by Polaris Dawn, but also other crews, having the most people simultaneously in space. Together with the crew of the ISS, the crew of Soyuz MS-26 and the three Chinese crew members of the Tiangong space station, the count went up to 19 people. We're still far away from a space-faring civilization by that count, but it's nice to see that this record was set at all. Would love to see 19,000 or even better 19 million people living and working in space or on other planets and moons at the same time. Polaris Dawn set a couple of other records. The most people simultaneously exposed to the vacuum of space, the first privately funded and operated spacewalk and the youngest person to perform a spacewalk. And with this, we're at the heart of the mission. The Spacewalk. The main mission objective of Polaris Dawn was to perform a spacewalk, or to use the precise term, an extravehicular activity, or EVA. But human beings are not made to survive in space. We need technology to protect us. To perform such an EVA, an astronaut trades his large spacecraft for the smallest possible, a suit. And for the first time in many years, this was a completely new suit for this purpose. SpaceX created them based on the Crew Dragon flight suits, but with a lot of modifications. The old suits just need to keep the crew alive while strapped in, should the capsule start to leak. The new EVA variant needs to provide mobility for the user to get around and outside of a vehicle. All four crew members wore these new suits, but only two of them performed the spacewalk. Jared Isaacman and Sarah Gillis. So why did all four astronauts wear the suits? That's because Crew Dragon is not equipped with an airlock. Instead, the capsule was drained of all atmosphere before Isaacman opened the hatch manually. The EVA itself consisted of a couple of mobility tests of the suit, while first Isaacman and later Gillis held on to the custom platform SpaceX called Skywalker. During the Spacewalk podcast, when everyday astronaut Tim Dodd spoke to the crew while they were still in space, both of them spoke about the experience of being directly exposed to space. Isaacman compared the EVA to his experience with the cupola that was installed for the Inspiration4 mission three years ago and noted that it was much more intense this time around. I believe the exact words were full body experience. 
Unfortunately for Gillis, she had to go after Isaac Man and did her EVA during Earth's night, almost in complete darkness except for the lights of the spacecraft. As for the suit's performance, the crew noted that it performed exactly as during training and that they look forward to future iterations that SpaceX supposedly will develop. Whatever those will look like, we can now at least be sure that they can produce suits that can protect an astronaut from the deadly environment that is the vacuum of space. Speaking of vacuum, this leads me to my next item. How to send a violin to space. One of the highlights of the mission was Sarah Gillis playing Ray's theme from the soundtrack of Star Wars The Force Awakens on a violin she brought along. Her recording was then mixed with performances of orchestras around the world and legendary composer John Williams was even involved in making this happen. However, one thing that's not as obvious is how to get a violin safely into space, especially when you have to expose the interior of your vehicle to the vacuum of space. Gillis goes into the details of qualifying a violin for spaceflight during the podcast I mentioned. They put multiple violins into a vacuum chamber and afterwards performed toxicity tests. The reason for that is that wood instruments will outgas when put into a vacuum and they had to make sure that no toxic substances would be created that way. And of course, that the thing could still be used afterwards. Apparently, the tests went well and the violin was qualified to fly aboard Crew Dragon. And perform, of course. Also, can we just talk about this picture for a second? That was one of the inspirational images that was created for the now cancelled Dear Moon project, which was designed to send multiple artists around the moon aboard Starship. It may not have been Starship and it may not have been in front of a giant panoramic window, but we got the violin player floating in space performing for an audience. As a bit of a music nerd, I also want to talk a bit about the significance of the piece that was chosen, Ray's theme. I know the sequel trilogy has divided the Star Wars fandom, but I think this piece is very fitting for the occasion. When Rey is introduced in the movie, she is alone. She does not yet know her place in the universe. She does not yet know what she will later be capable of. Stylistically, the theme is more of an adventure theme than a classic hero's theme and at times it feels almost melancholy. The symbolism for me here is that we all are Rey, us humans. So far, we are alone. We are still trying to make ends meet on our pale blue dot in this vast cosmic arena. We still have to find our place among the stars. We will certainly learn more things along the way and what an adventure it's going to be. In short, excellent choice of music and a wonderful performance by Sarah Gillis. While this was exceptional, the overall mission experience led me to another thought I would like to share with you. It's getting normal? Remember the ruckus when SpaceX landed their Falcon 9 booster successfully for the first time? It was utter madness inside their facility. Nowadays, missions for the rocket are only in the news when they are not landing successfully. Spaceflight is starting to become a bit more commonplace than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Sure, even back then there were regular flights to the ISS. But until the commercial crew vehicles, and yes, I still count Starliner among them even if it isn't in full operation yet, getting into space was more of a National Space Agency special interest kind of thing. Space tourists were a thing now and then, but they were few and far between. Since commercial space really took off, pun intended, the number of private missions has drastically increased. Not just Inspiration4 or the Polaris program, there is also Axiom Space who have already sent a couple of people into space. I think we are living at the pivotal time where spaceflight starts to turn from this elusive thing into something people will be able to perform at a reasonable price. It's getting normal, almost. But of course, there is still a long way to go before people that aren't multi-millionaires can afford it. Speaking of a long way to go, let's circle back to Polaris Dawn, because Polaris is not finished. Polaris Dawn was a historic flight, but it was not the last flight of the Polaris program. 
You heard that right, there is more to come. From what we know so far, two more flights are planned. One again with Crew Dragon and the final one with Starship. More details are not available right now, so we can only speculate. Originally, program founder Jared Isaacman and SpaceX wanted to use the second Polaris mission to boost the Hubble Space Telescope to a higher orbit in order to increase its lifespan. Unfortunately, NASA didn't take them up on that offer out of fear of damage to the space telescope. But the space agency didn't rule a private reboosting mission out categorically. Maybe a better proposal needs to be worked out than what SpaceX and the Polaris program had provided. As for the third mission, following the history-making pedigree of Polaris Dawn, it is said to be the first crewed mission for SpaceX's new fully reusable vehicle Starship. This is probably still a couple of years away. First, the vehicle needs to prove that it is safe for people to launch and return. What do you think what the Polaris program's next mission objectives are going to be now that the Hubble reboot is out of the question? There is only so much you can do and so far you can go with the Crew Dragon capsule. Let me know your ideas in the comments below. I'm going to keep an eye out for news surrounding this and hope to bring it to you in a condensed form like this. Do you like this format? Do you have any improvement suggestions? Again, comment below. Also, if you really want to support what I do here with this channel, maybe consider becoming a YouTube member or join me on Patreon. If you choose one of the higher tiers, you get early access to videos, which are always ad-free over on Patreon. Also, your name will show up over here together with all these fine folks that believe in this channel. Thank you so much for your support. It's just a small amount for each of you, but together we can make something happen. Just like we as humans are always better when we have a common goal to unite behind. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.